your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, uh, the passage that Jane read for us. And let me extend uh, my welcome as well to that of Roy, especially if you're new or visiting with us. It's great to have you here this morning. Uh, Julia is a relatively new Christian, having put her trust in Jesus only about a year or two ago. And at first, she felt great. There was a new zest and enthusiasm for life. Uh, she loved getting to know the other Christians at her church. She thrived on seeking to share Jesus with her friends. But recently, she's really been struggling with her sin. She keeps giving in to it again and again, and it's making her wonder whether she's really a Christian. Perhaps she's missed out on something along the way. And so she turns to the net, of course, and what a treasure trove. She didn't have any idea there was so much wisdom out there. Clearly, there are heaps of people who have the same feelings that she does. The truly spiritual life. One website says, eight steps for going deeper in your Christian walk, four ways to rid yourself of sin. It seems she was right after all. Trusting in Jesus is fine for when you start out, but clearly there's so much more on offer. Now, which one to try first? Roger's been a Christian for many years, but as he's aged, he's started to feel a bit dry spiritually. Prayers offered over many years seem to have fallen on deaf ears. He reads his Bible regularly, but he's read the passages multiple times before, and sometimes they can just feel a bit like words on the page. The blokes at the golf club enjoy having a dig at his Sunday holy club, and their lives seem to be so carefree especially compared to how hard his situation is at home and the fact that that doesn't look likely to change now. As Roger reflects on his life, his experiences and his feelings, he begins to question his faith. Maybe it's not as real as he thought it was once. After all, real Christians wouldn't feel the way he's feeling, would they? In a more vulnerable moment he opens up to his Christian friend Stan on Sunday morning. He shares what's been happening and, and how he's feeling and, and Stan listens and then he tells Roger that it sounds as though he has missed something, that there's a different way for the more serious-minded believer, for those who are spiritually advanced, if you know what I mean. What he needs to do is to connect with this higher way if he's ever going to be truly fulfilled. Julia and Roger are, of course, made up, but they could have been members of the church in Colossae. Well, well perhaps not Roger, because the church hadn't been going long enough for someone who's been a Christian for decades, but you get the picture. And they could easily, just as easily, be members of a church here in Engadine. What does the truly spiritual life look like? How might we experience feeling fulfilled? Where is fullness found? How do we grow and mature as Christian believers? These are some of the very real questions and issues that Paul addresses in our Bible passage for today. In the first talk in our series, if you were here, Roy alerted us to the fact that in first century Colossae, it was a bit like a religious buffet. There were Greek ideas and there were Jewish ideas floating around. And we'll see a bit of that this morning. And just before our passage today, in chapter 2, verse 4, Paul's mentioned the reality that people can be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. And it's a key purpose and desire of his that that not happen to his Colossian brothers and sisters. And so what he does now, as he turns in his letter to address some of these questions and issues, 
is that he takes up what he said earlier, some of the wonderful truths that he's been talking about in terms of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus has done, and he applies those to the, to the situation in Colossae, what these Colossian believers are facing. But before we look at what Paul says, let's pause and pray and ask for God's help as we look at this part of his word. Let's, let's pray. Lord, these are very real questions and issues, uh, feelings and experiences that we've raised already this morning. And we thank you for this part of your word that helps us so much. And we ask that you would help us to look to Christ in your word to lead and to guide us. Amen. Well, Paul's first word of counsel to tell his readers is that they're to continue in Christ. Facing these different threats, this religious buffet of ideas and philosophies, how are they to respond? Well, have a look with me at verses 6 and 7. How are they to respond? How are we to respond? Continue in the same way you began. These verses are kind of like motto verses, theme verses for this letter of Colossians. Verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. How do you keep going as a Christian? How do you keep growing as a Christian? Paul says the way you started is the way that you continue. Becoming a Christian is described here as receiving Christ as Lord. He becomes your number one, your leader. That's how you start out. And importantly for these Colossians, as they face these different ideas, and importantly for us, as we face our own alternatives, Paul says you keep going, you keep growing in the same way. See what he says there? Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. You see, we don't progress beyond Christ. We continue to look to Christ. Yes, we go deeper, but we only ever go deeper in him. What does this continuing in Christ look like exactly? Well, if you're into gardening, there's a plant picture here. We're to be rooted in Christ, putting those roots deep down into him. If gardening's not your thing, but construction is, there's another image here. We're to be built up in Christ. He's the foundation and we build our life on him. The faith that's been taught us about Jesus, who he is and what he's done, that's what's to strengthen us. And we're to be overflowing with thankfulness because we're so thankful for what Jesus has done and for who Jesus is. What do each of the images have in common? Christ, rooted in him, built up in him, strengthened in the faith about him and overflowing with thankfulness for him. You see, we're to be continuing in Christ as we began, so we keep going and growing. Now, why this is so important is what Paul goes on to explain next. You see, why can we and why should we continue just as we did in the first place with Christ as Lord? That doesn't sound particularly exotic, does it? It doesn't seem very special surely there's something more well we should and we can because as Paul goes on to say fullness is found in Christ and because false alternatives offer no spiritual good firstly then let's have a think about how fullness is found in Christ have a look at verse 8 with me verse 8 Paul writes see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Given what he's just said in verses 6 and 7, can you see the problem here? 
I hope you can. The most revealing part is at the end there, isn't it? These philosophies, these ideas, these teach, this teaching, it's hollow and deceptive. It depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than on Christ. If it's not depending on Christ, that's a problem, isn't it? Because he's just told us that we're to continue as we began with Christ as Lord. These other ways, they'll take you captive, Paul says. I'm sure you've heard or read or seen reports about different extremist groups coming into villages and towns and, and whisking away women and children against their will. It's frightening, isn't it? Paul says that's what can happen with these different ideas and teaching. They'll take you captive, he warns. And so what he does is he reminds the Colossians of what they have in Christ, that fullness is found in Christ. See verse 9? For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. He let us know, didn't he, back in chapter 1, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, chapter 119. Now he picks up those ideas and he helps the Colossians to relate them to their present situation. You don't need to go for these different ideas. You don't need to be taken in by this different teaching. Not when you realise that all of the fullness of the deity is found in Christ. Why look to anyone else? And not when you realise that you've been given fullness in Christ. If you've got Christ, you've got all you need. Why would you look to anything else? We can be fulfilled. We can be satisfied. We can find our all in him, in Jesus. That was one of the points of the kids' spot, wasn't it? It's not as though our thirst... In our thirst that we've just been given an, an empty glass and we're resigned to filling it with a little eyedropper of water, if that was the case, of course we'd always be looking elsewhere. And no, in Christ is all fullness. And if you believe in him, you've been given all fullness as well. Full for now and full for life everlasting. And so if that's true... Julia and Roger aren't missing out, are they? There's nothing more on offer because nothing more needs to be offered. There's not a different way for the more serious-minded, the more spiritually advanced. There's no higher way to be discovered in order to be fulfilled because all the fullness is found in Jesus. And remarkably, if you're a believer in him, you've been given all fullness in him as well. And that's the theme that Paul continues with in the verses that follow. In receiving Christ and accepting Christ as Lord, they'd experience the circumcision done by Christ, verse 11. You see, what had been promised in the Old Testament, they'd experience the reality of that. Their whole sinful nature had been put off. As Christ was buried and raised again, they'd been buried and raised again, verse 12. And so all of their sins, end of verse 13, had been forgiven in Christ. Not some, not many, not even most. All of them had been forgiven in him. The written code, the charge that could have been held over their heads because of their sin, verse 14, what's happened to it? Nailed to the cross. And the powers and the authorities that could have scared them and made them worried and so fearful, what's happened to them? Disarmed, verse 15. Their power's been broken. How? Because Christ has triumphed over them in himself by the cross. So why should you, why can you continue with Jesus as Lord? Why keep sticking with Jesus Look again at Christ. Remember who he is. Remember all he's done for us. See that fullness is found in Christ. 
So that's the first reason Paul gives us for continuing with Christ, for sticking with Jesus. That fullness is found in Christ. You don't need to look anywhere else. The second reason he gives us comes in the rest of the chapter, and that is that false alternatives offer no spiritual good. It's like the creaming soda in the kid's spot. False alternatives offer no spiritual good. Good. That's the theme, the idea that gets repeated three times over here. Have a look with me, first of all, from verse 16. He says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. See, there were in Paul's day, and there still are today, people who make believers feel inadequate, isn't there? Or lesser in some way, like Julia was feeling as she was searching the net. Because they don't do or they do do certain things. Here Paul mentions eating or drinking certain things, being involved or not involved in religious festivals or celebrations or special days. And it's so easy to feel judged, isn't it? You might remember a little while back, I don't know if it's still on the TV now, but there was this ad on TV for realestate.com.au and there were these three ladies and they were catching up for afternoon tea and one of them shares about how she was having trouble selling her home. And the other two ladies, quick as a flash, not a good guide for pastoral care, uh, they talk about how successful they've been through realestate.com.au. And with all the appropriate facial expressions, they say to the poor other lady, of course you've listed with realestate.com.au, haven't you? It's easy to feel judged, isn't it? This is the spiritual equivalent here. But Paul says, let's compare those things to Christ. Remember Christ in whom is all the fullness of the deity and in whom you've been given fullness. Those things are a shadow, he says. They're a shadow. The reality, the real deal is Christ. Why settle for the shadow? <laughs> Why go for the shadow? It's going to do you no good whatsoever. Its only purpose is to point you to something else anyway. You don't talk to a shadow, do you? And that something else is Christ, the one who you have and who has you. This same point about false alternatives offering no spiritual good is made again in the next few verses. Verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone who talks about some particular spiritual experience that they've had? Uh, maybe they'll say something about a, a vision or, or about heavenly beings or about some kind of divine moment they've experienced. It's very easy to walk away from those conversations and think, well, that's nice for them, but what about me? Why doesn't that happen to me? Should that be what happens to me? See, again, feelings of inadequacy and uncertainty and, and doubts creep in. But Paul says, see what's actually going on. See, this is a false humility, he says. There's nothing genuine or authentic about it. They're actually being puffed up in pride over what's happened to them. And far from being spiritual, see how he describes them? They've actually got an unspiritual mind. See, the whole problem is they've lost connection with the head, that is, with Christ. Remember the fullness? See, he's the one from whom the whole body grows as God causes it to grow. You stay connected to the head, to Christ, you stick with Christ, God will grow you. That's how it works. See, again, this is another false alternative, isn't it? As exciting and, and wonderful and appealing as it might sound, it offers absolutely no spiritual good in the end. 
A third time, Paul makes the same point. Verse 20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. See, these alternatives, they're going to sound effective, aren't they? Just make sure you don't handle this. Don't taste that. Don't touch. And then you'll be living in a way that pleases the Lord. See, they sound and they look so wise, just like Stan was saying to Roger. But Paul says, in the end, they just originate with humans and they'll perish just as we do. At the end of the day, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. They won't stop the flesh. They won't stop the sinful nature having its way. Only Christ the one with whom you've died and been raised again, only he can bring about that life-transforming change. Why can, why should Julia and Roger stick with Christ? Why can we, why should we continue with Jesus as Lord and keep sticking with Christ? Well, because as we saw earlier, fullness is found in Christ. And as we've just seen now, because false alternatives offer no spiritual good. In ancient Greek mythology, there were these figures called the sirens. They were two monsters who pretended to be beautiful women. They had amazing voices which they used to lure sailors to their island with the intention of killing them. Sitting beside the ocean, combing their long golden hair, they would sing to passing sailors. And anyone who heard their voices would be bewitched by its sweetness and drawn to the island like iron to magnet. Listen to how they tempted the hero Odysseus, a warrior returning home from the Trojan War with his sailors. Odysseus! Bravest of heroes, draw near to us on our green island. Odysseus, we'll teach you wisdom. We'll give you love sweeter than honey. The songs we sing soothe away sorrow. And in our arms, you will be happy. Odysseus, bravest of heroes, the songs we sing will bring you peace. See, Paul has warned us today, hasn't he? of being tempted by various songs and thoughts and ideas that promise wisdom and love, happiness and peace that tell us this is how you can be fulfilled. This is where fullness is found. This is the way to go and grow. And if you don't follow them, you're missing out. Another captain, not Odysseus this time, but Jason had to take his sailors past the islands of the sirens. Jason had a gifted musician on board by the name of Orpheus. When Orpheus played his lute, he had the gift of totally captivating his hearers. As long as he played, anyone who listened heard only his music. And so as they approached the sirens, Orpheus played and the sirens' bewitching songs were ignored because Jason and his men were captivated by the sweeter and more beautiful song of Orpheus. There are many false alternatives that are on offer that will ultimately do you no spiritual good. They will instead capture you like the sirens. But if you are a Christian, you have heard the sweeter and more beautiful song of the gospel, haven't you? What would Paul say? Keep being captured by the music of the gospel. Keep being reminded of the fullness that is in Christ 
and that you have been given all fullness in him. Continue to listen to the sweeter and more beautiful song of your Saviour and Lord Jesus Christ. Continue as you began, with Christ as Lord, looking to Christ alone and sticking with Christ alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you again this morning for Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And we thank you that amazingly we have been given fullness in Christ. Please help us to see any alternative to Christ for what it is, false alternatives that in the end offer us no spiritual good. As we've received Christ as Lord, may we continue to live in him. May we stick with Jesus all our days. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.